that wants to go fishing. And the couple is Loris and Meisha. And Loris and Meisha decide to go fishing. They leave their house, they go on a bridge, they walk down across the bridge, they go to the river. And as they walk down the river to find a favorite fishing spot, they see tons of trash at the bottom of the river. And the question is, how do Dolores and Misha deal with the trash? And a not racist approach might be like downstream, we're just gonna clean up the trash, right? So you see that in, that, in, in those quotes too, right? Like if you have, if something comes up, come and talk to me, like it, it appears like there's, there's trash. A midstream approach might be, well, let's prevent trash by putting signs like please don't litter or let's put more trash cans. And then a more sort of proactive anti-racist approach would be more systemic. Well, let's think about us producing trash and how do we produce trash as a whole, right? So if we were to compare that with thinking about um, oppression, we might think about COVID-19 or heteropatriarch is more systemic, like upstream back at the back at the bridge when they sound board is started walking to the fishing versus downstream is more individual when trash appears. Like, let me just write this in my syllabus. Let me talk about this in my office hours or classroom techniques. So it's interesting the term anti-racist pedagogies if we expand it conceptually and think about all the ways that we, we are engaging with it, not only for us as an individual with our class, but us with other entities like CAPIS or other ARC or Empower Center, accommodations, but then also the social conditions that shape us as faculty, staff, librarians, as well as our, the communities that we're engaging with in terms of our students and their communities as well. So just sort of a, a framing of thinking about these upstream factors that shape learning and that the techniques may focus on individual, but how do these techniques or pedagogies also engage with these upstream factors? So an, other way to think about these examples is these are some stats that I pulled from various sources, the Atlantic, et cetera. You can just take a moment and, and, and look through them. And you can sort of think about, well, let's take a moment and read through them. And invite you to take breath, find your grounding, because these are not easy stats. And so it's an interesting way if we take a downstream approach that's individual, that's with our office hours, that's with our syllabus, with classroom teaching techniques, then we lose some things, right? So the stat of nearly one in three Black Americans in the US have had a firsthand experience with the COVID-19 death is a really big statement. My throat is casting, right? And then if we have an a, a interpolation of things that happen around whiteness and blackness and around um, health inequities, those impact various um, ways in which our students show up, we show up, our community partners show up. So I'm offering this musing about thinking about anti-racism as critical consciousness and social action. This is a picture of Palo Ferry. CTL had a, a um, what was it? No Stress, No Worries book club. It was such a great title. Maybe it was so inviting. Like, I'm going to just show up. That was so great. So they had one, I think, on Pedagogy of Freedom. So this is sort of bridging that. Um, I was very lucky to be, in, to be inspired and mentored by various scholars like Margot Okazar Ray and Michael James, who worked with Ferry and then um, continued to work with uh, lost grad students like me in ethnic studies. So I, I have a framing of ethnic studies and feminist studies approach and thinking about critical consciousness and social action as the purpose of education and thinking about it in terms of um, um, how do we approach anti-racism, not just with strategies and techniques, but also a framing. So it's upstream factors, it's also about relationality so that the, the, the task of teaching and learning isn't just transactional. It isn't just content delivery, delivery received. There's, there's a relationality to the knowledge and also to each other. And there's an element of liberatory, a liberation, right? There's an, an element of transformative change. 
Um, so that was a lot and, and we sort of went through upstream and downstream in relation to the river parable and trying to link anti-racism with upstream and downstream. And then thinking about critical conscious social action as, as sort of um, an anti-racist approach. In terms of proactive and reactive pedagogies, I was thinking about what, what, what can we do um, that's engaging with these upstream and downstream factors. So um, what I have here is a quote from Margot Olkazar Ray, who is a, a significant feminist scholar, um, Asian American Studies in the Department of Asian American Studies. We have a, a Margot Olkazar Ray Summer Social Justice Fellowship. I think it's in its 11th or 12th year. Um, she has worked on a global uh, scale in terms of thinking about anti-militarism and feminism. And um, we were just in conversation talking about a potential project. I was like, oh, this is perfect for the workshop. And you can see there's thematically similar things with Freire and also with James Baldwin. So I'll give you a moment to pause and read it. So this is Margot, oops, Margot in the orange right here to the second to the left of the screen. And here's the good news. She's moving to Pilgrim Place in December. So she is so excited to be in conversation with DPL and continue with Asian American Studies. Um, and she, whenever she comes for her report box for her scholarship, where students do community engaged projects, um, she engages with staff and faculty students. So we're really excited that she's coming. So what you can see in this quote is if we are to do the sort of more evidence-based positive, positivist lens is there's questioning the self, like attitudes, values, and habits, right? And then interweaving, I think Esther, someone put in the sociological imagination, like the weaving of history and biography. But I think what's interesting is in this quote, in problem posing and framing it as an anti-racist practice of taking into account social conditions like upstream factors, is it's the complex relationships. This is also what Ju Julie talked about. And then getting at the root causes of oppression, like poverty, heteropatriarchy. And it's the basis of that seeing and knowing and understanding and naming those contracts and those relationships that is the basis for critical thinking as well as action. So the action piece is really important here. So example, um, so I, so I teach classes like community health, health inequities, racial politics of teaching methods, which sounds kind of opaque, but is actually a really exciting class to teach. Um, so I took this example where um, I, the purpose of, of the task of the project was identify upstream factors in relation to different positionalities. It was a social theory class that had a community engagement component. And I called it social biographies, and that really comes from Michael James and other scholar activists who worked with Ferry and Margot. Um, and the task is they had to identify a social contradiction. Social contradiction meaning something was said one way and then they manifest the reality another way. So they had to find an example in their lives pre-COVID. Um, so maybe um, um, the uh, Disney concert hall, and then there were all these tents of housing insecure, like that was a contradiction, right? Um, and the task was to find these contradictions in the social theorists that we were reading. So that could be like Bourdieu or Gramsci or Tikahan. Three examples of events of a social contradiction in their own lives and then with our community partner. And so I have a picture of a tree here. This isn't the tree of my students because I'm not going to campus, but it's in my office. But they basically took wires and they created a wire tree. And then they, they created leaves that they dangled that were different examples of the events of social contradictions of each of the parties or social things. And then they, they color coded it, made the material similar, different. And then they had some leaves falling to sort of show that it was dynamic over time intergenerationally. So that was an example of problem posing in the sense of they understood themselves, they understood the theorists, 
the community partner and the way that they relate and interacted with each other. <clears throat> Another example, um, let's see. So that was sort of a larger scale assignment. So we did like four or five weeks of reading, discussion, and this was sort of the big assessment or the equivalent of an exam. To give you smaller scale examples, um, was I might do warm up prompts. So like what we practice today, what inspires you? I might have a prompt of who are your ancestors or communities that you feel comfortable sharing that you would like to bring in the room. We might change our name up in the top right corner. We might have people bring in an object that represents community or what a sense of belonging means to you. Um, we've done movement based things and also music things like we've done Spotify playlists that represent a social contradiction. contradiction. Other examples I've done um, for variations of problem posing that isn't just the scale of an exam, but could be done across disciplines is maybe they've done a portrait of their self, their communities and strengths and challenges. But you can see the commonalities of, of weaving people in context. It's about context and relationality that is both past, present and future. <clears throat> 